that is that strange no you're fine yeah okay thank you juliet for the reminder i just started recording and we're gonna go we're gonna start the webinar now oh, my heart hat now <laughs> okay off. so change my shirt the webinar has started um and slowly there are people attending which is very exciting welcome um i'm going to share my screen uh just so that everyone can see so yeah people are rolling in and that's really great um it's nice to to see the numbers cry, climb in the participants uh, list. Um, welcome to the second of uh, a three part webinar series. Um, this event is very much uh, a product of the pandemic, uh, a substitute of sorts for what would have been uh, the Ar um, Architectural Conservancy of Ontario Toronto branches annual symposium which is usually a one day and in-person affair. And while recognizing that a lot of folks are, um, are Zoomed out these days, I'm, I am especially uh, grateful for everyone who decided to spend an hour and a half with us. Um, and also sort of grateful for this unique sort of setting where we get to gather um, participants from uh, across uh, across this entire continent. Um, so welcome to everyone, both our uh, attendees and our panelists. Um, this series themes, uh, demolition, deconstruction and displacement represent a critical form of reflection, not only for the heritage discourse, but for broader con uh, conversations within architecture, urbanism and landscape studies. Through these conversations, we are exploring not only the physical accumulations of buildings, but also the materials that they generate at their so-called end of life. Um, and beyond that, sort of the cultural imprint of these processes, what it means to take them apart. So um, my name is Alison Kriba, and I run a small practice uh, called Local Technique which operates at the intersection of architectural conservation and waste. And it explores the possible futures and entangled pasts of sites, structures, and materials. And I do this in multiple ways. And one of them is uh, this series, uh, which uh, I pitched and was accepted um, to prepare on behalf of ACO Toronto. So to tell you a little bit more about ACO Toronto is Matt Zambri, our, the president of the organization. Oh, thanks, Alison. Um, I just want to say thank you everyone for participating in our second, second um, panel discussion. Um, very excited uh, for tonight. Um, I wanted to also say that um, these events are made possible for by our members. So. If you are not a member, um, we hope that you would consider joining us. If you are a member, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, our advocacy is um, through our advocacy is about spreading the kind of knowledge of heritage um, out there through public education. Um, and again, Allison was speaking earlier that like this event is normally done live, and we've had to take a whole different approach to our our yearly symposium. Um, but we like to throw more than one event in a year normally, but um, we've been really restricted with the with the pandemic. So we hope that you guys um, like that we put together tonight and without taking any more time and listening to our panelists that we came to see tonight, I will um, wish you all a good evening and hope you enjoy yourselves. Thanks, Matt. So before we continue, um, a couple pieces of housekeeping. Uh, the first thing that everyone should note is that this event is a webinar, which means audience members can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, this event is being recorded and will be uh, posted online at a later date. 
And questions and comments can be submitted in the chat. Um, uh, our lovely assistant, um, Juliet Cook, will be monitoring the chat and um, will be uh, respond. Will will be taking questions from the audience uh, at the sort of final session, or final segment of this session. Um, and I think that's it. So to start, um, we're going to start with a, a quick um, thought experiment. Uh, I want everyone to uh, sort of situate themselves and think about the structure that you are currently inhabiting. Now deconstruct that structure and imagine the one that stood in its place before it. Think about all the people that inhabited it and the materials that it took to get there. Now deconstruct that structure and think about the sort of movement of those parts and people, and where they came from and where they are now. Now continue, continue, continue this visualization um, through the sequence of structures, materials and inhabitants until you arrive at the land itself. So here in Toronto or Tokoronto, this land was inhabited and cared for and, can, and is still by, um, by many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And as I said, it remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And we are very um, grateful for um, those generations of stewards who have allowed us to uh, bring this event to you tonight. Um, so to introduce uh, the topic at hand, oh, many thanks, sorry, that was a slide. Um, tonight's discussion on deconstruction um, builds on last week's theme on demolition. Uh, and in it, we heard about uh, the demolition trade in North America and the evolution of the tools that were used and about how demolition was promoted not only through municipal policies, but also a broader culture of clearance where the bull bulldozer permeated lifestyle magazines and children's books as a marker of progress. From Toronto, we heard uh, from Jordan Tepperman, fifth generation in one of the city's oldest demolition companies a perspective that is rarely heard among, amongst heritage crowds. Mr. Tepperman told us a story of a different kind of story, a different kind of progress. One about a growing city, a business and a trade. Demolition in Toronto, he suggested, and likely in many places, is rarely an indicator of a building's diminished value or its uh, end of life sorry, despite its end of life, but instead it illustrates the increasing value of the land on which it stands. In the heritage community, demolition represents both material and cultural loss and has been a key catalyzing force against which it rallies. But recent calls to action have drawn attention to the environmental and cultural impact of these processes, which generate significant amounts of waste and displaced communities amongst other things. So deconstruction is considered an alternative to demolition, yet in exploring its history, um, we come to see that these two processes are in fact linked. Deconstruction is a form of careful unbuilding, which conserves the value of architectural components so that they can be reused elsewhere. In last week's event, we learned how deconstruction was the norm at the turn of the century when buildings had to come down, where wreckers salvaged and sold material in order to subsidize their labor. Today, deconstruction is experiencing a resurgence. It uh, recognizes the irreplaceability, not just of architectural materials and the vernacular languages that they express, but the forests, mine, um, as well as exhaustive global networks on which they rely. 
In this context, deconstruction is seen as a strategy for material conservation where whole buildings cannot be retained, but also, as we will hear, a broader mode of cultural conservation, ensuring continuity across generations. In Toronto, deconstruction has been employed in several large um, projects, including recently uh, the Loblaws Grossetaria at the foot of uh, Lakeshore and Bathurst, and the still ongoing project at Mervish Village. And while encouraging these cases of selective um, salvage of brick and stone also feel incomplete when considering the significant volumes of structural timber and steel and other materials that are not retained. In this way, de deconstruction here at this moment also reveals a bias. Uh, it indicates which materials, histories, and related landscapes are considered worth saving and which are not. So critically looking and indeed redefining this, the, the distinction between waste and heritage, deconstruction represents a powerful opportunity to dismantle more than just buildings. And tonight's uh, four panelists are going to share a range of perspectives on how it, it does so. And hopefully the conversation that follows will as well. So I'm going to introduce the speakers tonight um, in the order in which they will speak. Um, uh, we, each presenter will offer a 15 minute uh, presentation, uh, or sorry, a, a little bit shorter than 15 minutes. Um, we'll spend um, uh, 15 minutes uh, discussing amongst ourselves some of the ideas that have been brought up in the presentations. And then we'll open the discussion to the floor where we will receive uh, and read um, some questions that are selected from those that are deposited into the question and answer period uh, chat function. So uh, moving on, I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, first up is Susan Ross. She is an architect who teaches sustainable heritage conservation at Carleton University. Her current writing focuses on material salvage and reuse as a part of rethinking heritage values. Among her many contributions to books and journals in 2019, Susan uh, co-edited a special edition on waste and heritage in the Journal of Cultural Heritage Management and Sustainable Design. And among the many talks she's delivered on the subject, she also convened a symposium called Heritage in Reverse uh, the year before. Um, Adam Cornell uh, is a certified passive house builder and deconstruction and reclaim. Oh, by that, sorry. <laughs> um, and deconstruction and reclaimed wood expert. He flipped his first house at 16 with his father and launched Unbuilders Deconstruction in January of 2018. He is based in Vancouver, North Vancouver, um, and is passionate about his family, skiing, hiking mountains, and spending as much time outdoors uh, as he can. And he is committed to providing a sustainable future for generations to enjoy. Um, Dr. Hazel and Rick Denhart understand deconstruction to be both a physical and phenomenological tool for com community cohesion. Amongst their wide ranging careers, the Denharts have worked in and with communities to understand the meaning and value of materials. Together, the Denharts are presenting, a pr uh, presently authoring a new book, Raising the Roof, Deconstruction for Community Health and Legacy on the community benefits of deconstruction for release uh, in December of this year. And finally, uh, Dr. Andrew Judge is Assistant Professor of Anishinaabe Studies at Algoma University and Shuingwak Kingumang Gamig, and also teaches at the University of Waterloo. Apologies for the pronunciation there. Um, he, specializes, he specializes in Anishinaabe cultural knowledge, ethnomedicine, and land-based learning. He has learned from, worked with, and consulted with, and served Indigenous elders and community leaders for over a decade. He has also founded several community-led Indigenous knowledge-based programs at elementary, secondary, and post-secondary levels, 
and works tirelessly to promote land-based and sustainable practices. So I'm very uh, delighted to welcome everyone. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to Susan. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you, Allison, for the invitation to be part of this essential conversation. Since we first met about five years ago, Allison has been a vital collaborator in my work on heritage and waste, identifying many important avenues to explore. This series is recognizably her design in its critical focus and flair. So my talk is going to focus on deconstruction in relation to heritage and sustainability. Last week's focus on demolition was framed by urban history. Tonight, I'd start to bridge to sustainability perspectives and to deconstruction as heritage action by suggesting we also need to think about the environmental histories of cities and materials. This is fundamental to understanding how broader building and materials reuse can help address urgent goals for sustainability. This includes defining and implementing strategies to address resource scarcities and inequities and climate justice. To speak about sustainable development in 2021, it's inevitable that we think about the pressing global objectives identified by the United Nations. Three of the 17 goals that relate directly to deconstruction and heritage are shown here. Addressing the consumption and waste of building materials expands and repositions strategies of energy efficiency and decarbonization. It also challenges a narrow focus on single heritage buildings, calling for broader urban and landscape approaches. Great potential exists in the deconstruction of building components to contribute to sound stewardship and conservation of the environment. There's equally important potential to address objectives of social, economic and cultural sustainability. However, there are limits to what deconstruction alone can achieve. I'm sure we'll hear more than one definition this evening. In fact, Allison started it, but I always find it helpful to start by explaining what we think deconstruction is. So as you can see in this definition, beyond the notion of unbuilding or construction in reverse to reclaim materials, what happens next, such as the storage and taking stock of what has been reclaimed, and making plans for reuse are equally important. Deconstruction is thus a first stage in a series of multiple actions with many actors and places, and each of these can contribute to sustaining and or transforming a range of values. As you will soon see in my focus tonight, I can't help but look at the other stages, activities, and related places. So this is uh, an excerpt from my post on deconstruction that I wrote for the Discard Studies blog a few years ago. Discard studies, in case you haven't heard of it, provides a context for more critical thinking about society's approaches to waste. And in that context, I focused also on the issues of deconstruction, including its limited impact so far, and what might be seen as the conflicting goals of preserving whole buildings and their heritage values. Closely connected to a critical understanding of how deconstruction can help with sustainability and heritage objectives is to recognize that actions associated with each stage are not black and white. And Allison has already alluded to this, how demolition and deconstruction can be interconnected. Uh, and in fact, thinking that way partly comes from working with her. So while it's important to be able to distinguish between actions or measure their relative impact, we should also recognize that almost inevitably some amount of demolition will be part of a deconstruction process, that salvaging for reuse may also include some recycling. And in some cases, what we've been calling reuse might be more usefully conceptualized as continued use. Understanding why and where to draw the line between intentions and outcomes helps to define the limits and feasibility in specific contexts. So here, for example, is one of the early case studies to document the increased possibilities that arise when deconstruction salvage and reuse all happen on the same site. This case involved the deconstruction of a building from the 1960s that contained highly valued timber 
to make place for a new building erected in the early 2000s, which reused this timber, but also highlighted the site's mature trees. The case of UBC's Panhellenic House and its material reincarnation in the Lew Center for the Study of Global Issues is exceptional regarding documentation and assessment of the process and results, with reports first on how deconstruction took place and then how the salvage materials were integrated in the design for the new building. The University of British Columbia's interest in its modernist architectural heritage and in using the campus as a laboratory for sustainable design created a rich context to develop technical understanding of the possibilities. There are surprisingly few thorough documented cases that take you from deconstruction through salvage to reuse. And this is partly because of the in-between time and the in-between sites that usually disconnect deconstruction from reuse. Last week's discussion highlighted how stronger policies are needed to address widespread demolition. Pilot projects and early case studies have been very important in developing a range of policies and guidelines to foster deconstruction. A few notable examples include a groundbreaking deconstruction ordinance in Portland and the Green Demolition Bylaw in Vancouver, which I expect we'll hear more about from Adam. Other North American cities are joining in. Pittsburgh, San Antonio, and Victoria are the most recent that I know of. The focus on urban context is important as are broader initiatives at the provincial or state and federal levels. And beyond regulatory context, there are many other useful types of guidelines from the official Canadian Standards Association standard for building and deconstruction to the less official guides like the Ecology Action Center's Waste Not Construction and Demolition Toolkit from Nova Scotia. A code of ethics for the salvage industry, which depends on a membership-based approach and guidance from public housing agencies on social and economic potential of deconstruction are other examples of the kind of guidelines that are out there. Some of these relate more to heritage or not. They often focus more on deconstruction and or salvage and less on materials reuse itself. So how can heritage goals and processes be brought in? In some cases they are, such as in Vancouver's policy with reference to character homes, but these references can be so incomplete that they are challenged to see as really integrating heritage considerations. Materials reuse also needs to be explicitly addressed, or most of the materials that are deconstructed end up being recycled. We also need to ask how heritage policies can change. How can they lead to less dumpsters outside of renovations and retrofit projects and more salvage for both repair and reuse, both on site and off? Surely proponents of architectural conservation are well positioned to be providing constructive advice on how to integrate these materials as part of rehabilitation or restoration but also broader urban conservation strategies like infill and additions. And as Tina McCarthy has eloquently argued, an obvious strategy to start with is to have deconstruction identified as a heritage treatment type. And here you see Tina speaking at the Heritage in Reverse Symposium at Carleton in 2018. To my mind, a key concern is about how the transfer of heritage values from buildings to materials takes place and how this then relates to the creation of new values. But this will vary depending on so many factors. So these two images from the Construction Junction Reuse Center in Pittsburgh suggest the scope of values and approaches to think about. On the left is the resale of a salvaged historic quarter song oak entryway, complete with cut crystal glass and hardware. While integrity and authenticity play leading roles in the preservation of durability and craft, its reuse could be reframed by exploring how its new use or position compares to its original context. Doing some of the other type of deconstructing potentially that Allison was talking about. On the right, in contrast, is the entryway to the redesign lab Project RE built within the Construction Junction Reuse Center, which demonstrates how a very different type of salvage door, the more ordinary panel door available by the hundreds might be reinvented. Sites of material exchange like this are becoming places for new kinds of training for repair and transformation. Construction Junction, which was a demonstration site at the Build Reuse Organizations Conference in 2019, is an instructive model of the possibilities of in-between places, sites where values are preserved and transformed. To get from the deconstruction site to the new reuse site often needs these in-between sites. Places associated with the middle stage between reuse are important, as I've been saying, for developing skills in repair and adaptation and also building public awareness 
and creative responses. They can become destinations that, complete, that could compete with building supply stores, offering a lot more. I suspect that interest in reuse will continue to grow, but it will need to compete with interest in making new products from recycled waste materials. Recycling is now more successful than reuse by a long stretch, but it involves a lot more waste and loss of value and multiple environmental impacts. In North America, a substantial part of the salvage industry has been dominated by models that involve donations, but also, most importantly, multiple social objectives that confer on them many other possible new values related to resource equity and climate justice objectives mentioned earlier. These places are very important as part of the future of deconstruction. I have mainly focused on North America, but we have a lot to learn from Europe. Rotor in Brussels and their side initiatives, Opalis and Rotor DC, are one group that I learned to know better through Allison, who completed a practicum there in 2018. Rotor is behind many initiatives that help expand the circulation of materials across the full range of the building stock and through the full life cycle and all of the different stages I've been talking about, including for much larger modern structures. They carry out deconstruction itself, but also are facilitating the circulation of materials through their salvage yard, their workshops for repair and showrooms. Their offerings and expertise are shared through rich online web-based publications and tools. For example, they've also helped develop an online inventory for resellers of building materials across Northern, Northwestern Europe, helping scale up the possibilities. And through all of this, they are tracking their insights on the challenges of specific types of materials and analyzing their experiences around the tensions between heritage and salvage. There are many more ways that heritage work can contribute, helping plan for policies, but also infrastructure to support salvage materials, engaging in new types of training to expand skills and understanding, mapping out where demolition is happening to understand what kind of deconstruction will be needed. Building related discards are but one context for rethinking heritage and waste. To think about how we can make our work less wasteful and fairer, other heritage sectors are, will also need to be brought into this, from museums and parks to intangible heritage and tourism interpretation. And I look forward tonight to discussing what we each are bringing to this. So here you see um, information about my website, Waste Heritage Research, which has a lot of resources. Uh, from references to blog posts about all kinds of related places and ideas. So we'll take a look and thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Susan. It's very exciting to see all of that. Hazel and Rick are clapping as I'm sure so many audience members are. Um, I'll pass it over to Adam. Thank you. Um, I could speak for 12 to 15 minutes just on all, everything Susan just spoke about. So this is going to be difficult. I got my timer on here to keep me on point. Um, okay. All right. So uh, my name is Adam Cornell. I'm the founder and CEO of Unbuilders and Heritage Lumber. Um, and uh, we are presenting a new future for old buildings. Um, so before I really get into it, I want to make clear that uh, I am a massive lover of heritage. And I wish that most of the buildings we take down were preserved. So I feel like we sometimes get criticism for the buildings we take down. And we are not promoting tearing down heritage buildings. Um, but once those decisions have been made by building owners, we want to give them an alternative uh, to the end of life of those materials. So looking at the construction sector in general and the, the big problem that, that we're tackling and, and why we launched on builders, um, the Canadian construction industry is the largest contributor of solid waste in the country. Uh, it's about 4 million tons annually, and that equates to about 20 million tons of CO2. Um, that's released through those materials going to landfill, decomposing, and creating methane. Uh, so it, it is enormous. It's about 40% of all of our waste in the country is from construction and demolition. Um, when you break that waste down, uh, 1.5 million tons of it is just lumber, and 100% of that is salvageable or in the very least recyclable. And when you break that lumber down further, a huge portion of it's old growth lumber, 
um, much more so on the West Coast than in Toronto. You just have to go back a few few more decades in Toronto to get to the old growth. But um, nonetheless, everything on the, in, in the West pre-1970 is old growth. In Toronto, it's probably more like pre-World War II. It was old growth lumber. Um, and it's actually interesting that in Toronto, the salvage is focused on the brick, whereas here the salvage is focused on the lumber and the brick isn't really salvaged very much. So uh, we just don't have a lot of brick in, uh, in Western Canada. Uh, just a very quick glimpse of demolition. You are all very familiar with it. I'm sure the people that made this video thought it was a cool video watching a machine smash apart a building, uh, whereas this just breaks my heart for all of the valuable materials that they are just disposing of. Looking at the solution uh, that, that we are operating under, which others uh, primarily in the US are also operating under, is that char charitable model, which uh, Susan touched on. Um, we are also evolving towards uh, a non-charitable model, so an acquisition model where we actually purchase the materials of the house uh, or building and get away from the donation model. I'm a firm believer that for any industry to become legitimate and really drive forward, um, it has to be driven by uh, for-profit businesses. I think the amount of charitable involvement and nonprofit as the major player in deconstruction has actually delegitimized it as a large industry and large business, which we're trying to show um, this is a great business, so it is big business. Um, so we launched on Builders in 2018 after deconstructing for several years under my contracting company when I was building houses and fixing up heritage homes. Um, we're the first dedicated deconstruction company in the country. Um, I find it ironic that the Salvage Kings demolition, or Priestly Demolition in Toronto, they salvage probably 1% of what we do out of a building. Um, so last year alone, we diverted over 1,500 tons from the landfill, and uh, we've hit over 99% salvage and recycle on some of our projects. Uh, our average is about 95% waste diversion. <clears throat> and then on the back end, we have Heritage Lumber. So that's our, our lumber brokerage, um, soon to be product manufacturer. And, um, and we're also helping redistribute the other goods to our charitable partner, Habitat for Humanity. And we're also partnered with the reuse people who operate more so in the US, but um, we're working with here as well. And Habitat, the goods that we donate to them, um, it actually gets a tax receipt for the owner. So that's part of how we combat the additional cost to demolition, um, which is definitely one of the biggest hurdles for deconstruction right now in the country before policy is, in, is enacted. Uh, just looking at what a hand deconstruction looks like quite in contrast to a demolition. Um, so we'd already stripped out the building on the inside, done the initial salvage, removed the asbestos, the insulation, the drywall, and then we reverse engineer and work our way down. Um, we're separating the materials on site. This video is a, a few years old now. We're much cleaner on site now. <clears throat> and we're also operating um, with some heavy machinery to speed up the process. Um, but you can see it's quite a different look. So we're th this house, we hit over 99% salvage and recycle on. Um, and that's just from on-site waste diversion. And, uh, and just taking some extra time to make sure that these materials don't end up in the landfill. The biggest hurdles with deconstruction, um, cost, time, the outlet for the materials, and then policy. So policy right now, at least in Canada, most places in Canada, most places in the US are much more in favor of demolition. It's sort of stacked against us and we're working heavily with policymakers to change that. Um, so we actually are, presenting to the city of Toronto in a few weeks. We're working hard because we want to be spreading on builders across the country. So um, we're trying to show what is being done in the West can easily be done across the country in both Canada and the US. Um, and we wanna make sure that um, we, can, we can assist in the regions where the demand is. And there's a lot of demand for unbuilders to be in Toronto. Um, so when it comes to the cost and time, one of the ways we've started combating that is we're now bringing in heavy machinery and we're pulling buildings apart in big sections. So we do a lot of residential work. It's our sort of bread and butter, um, but we are doing up to four story buildings now as well. Um, and so we craned this building apart in big sections. Um, so what would have taken us typically three weeks, we did it in a day and a half. And then we bring those materials back to our receiving site. Um, so it's much like prefab construction. You do all the work off site and then bring it out um, to site and build the building. We take it apart in big sections, bring it back to our yard, and then we do the dismantling there to just get ourselves off site and get the builders building again. 
Now, the real heartbeat of our business and, and the main thing that drove me into uh, or, or made me shift from a builder to an unbuilder is the old growth lumber that we're recovering. Um, and this is, th these are trees up to 2000 years old. Uh, I live in Lynn Valley in North Vancouver. In all the parks around me, um, we still see the tree stumps of these big, beautiful old trees. Um, and I actually took our whole, our whole team last week to an old growth grove that's still standing not far from my house. It's literally the only one left on the North shore. Um, and these trees are uh, very rare. We have less than 3% left on the West coast of Canada and they're actually still logging them. There's big protests happening right now in, a, in an old growth stand. Um, it's shameful that we're still logging this material. And it's a scarce resource. And so the only place we can find this material as dimensional lumber is locked behind the walls of our buildings. Um, and we really need to look at it differently. This is not waste or just your standard lumber. This is something special. This is a piece of not only Canadian history, but it's really the legacy of the land that we have built our cities on. The First Nations stewarded these materials or, or they, they you know, worshiped the trees. They didn't cut clear cut the forest like um, the, like the colonial Canadians have since. And it's something that we need to get back to really putting a lot of emphasis on how important this material is. Um, and old growth lumber in general has a lot of benefits. I'll get into more of them, but um, it's three times stronger than new lumber. It's better wood, tighter grain, and it's harder. And uh, reclaimed wood in general has 12 times less embodied carbon than new lumber which makes reclaimed wood the greenest building material on the planet. So if we want to build a sustainable future and sustainable cities, we need to recover all of these materials that we can. And in Vancouver, we're probably the youngest major city in the world, um, but yet our whole city was built with ancient trees. And so it's something to really tie back into time that this city is 120 years old or 140 years old, but it's built with 2000 year old trees. Uh, just a few of the products when I was still building, we were incorporating reclaimed wood, we were deconstructing, remanufacturing and reinstalling products in our houses. Um, so we were doing full circle um, within our projects and um, something big for, for our company as we move into this summer and start to make our own products again uh, on a larger scale. We want to show that these, uh, this wood can be used for really modern um, design as well. I feel like um, we're used to seeing sort of the middle picture here, the rustic look, um, but reclaimed wood, it, it can be used for any sort of design aesthetic. It's, it's really durable. I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna just blast through this. Um, so on top, there's, there's several layers of positive impact of deconstruction. The environmental one is the most obvious. Um, so I've already gone through um, these points. Um, the last one being that our landfills are overflowing. Um, so I'm not sure about the GTA, how the landfills are doing, but I know in Vancouver, we're going to close our landfill 12 years ahead of schedule, which means we're going to have to plow um, farmland in the ALR or extremely expensive land. It's $12 million an acre in Vancouver for land. Um, the landfills are, you know, typically about 70 acres. So you can just factor in how expensive it is to open another landfill. Um, and in Victoria, to expand the landfill, which is the other area we operate in, they literally would have to clear cut a forest to then just continue to dump our waste. On the social side, um, there's a lot of social impact, positive social impact for deconstruction. Not only is it better for the communities, so it's quieter, cleaner. Um, our crews in particular really become entrenched in the communities. We have people that show up that may be upset that the house or the building is coming down to begin with. And when they start talking to our crews, figure out what we're doing, they get really excited and we start to have the community coming around our sites every day, getting really excited to see these materials piling up. So um, deconstruction is a way to take a really negative part of our society and turn it positive and, and see a lot of excitement in the end when people know at least these materials are being salvaged. Uh, and then the big dirty secret of demolition um, is just this health issue. And this is something that we're beginning to raise. Um, but on our deconstruction sites, we typically have two callbacks for abatement. Um, after the building's already been cleared, there's already been a professional to say, there's no asbestos in this building, you're good to go, which shows us that every single demolition happening in our communities still has asbestos in it. And that is becoming airborne and that's contaminating our recycling facilities and our landfills. 
Uh, the only way to actually truly abate this material out is to deconstruct it layer by layer. Uh, and the last benefit is the economics of it. Deconstruction creates a ton of jobs. Um, we predict the transition from demolition to deconstruction in Canada would be more than a quarter million jobs just on site, uh, let alone all the other periphery jobs that are created through transportation, material sales, material remanufacturing. Um, and economically, it's, it's roughly about $19 billion a year that's added to the economy, and that's an extremely conservative number. And again, that's just on the, the service and the sale of the wood at wholesale price. So looking forward, um, the one thing that's not on here, which should be the first one on the list is preserve, especially since we're talking about heritage. Um, but if a building is gonna come down, we have to deconstruct them. Um, there is no doubt that that is the future and the past of the industry. Um, and we need to start incorporating our used building materials back into new design. Um, so as I said, it's the greenest way you can design is to use green or used reclaim building materials, brick, lumber, metal, windows, doors, whatever it is. Windows are a bit tricky with energy codes, but, um, and then lastly, low impact design. So I'm assuming that most of the audience is architects. Um, so starting to think about the, the end of life of new buildings that, that you're designing, um, designing for disassembly, thinking about what is, uh, what, how is this building gonna change through time? Maybe the use is gonna change and how can we adapt and change the building without destroying materials? every single time that happens. Um, on a residential side, we renovate our houses every 10 to 12 years in North America. Um, and we, uh, we're building them with single use products in a single use manner. So it really makes no sense at all. Uh, our tagline is it's not waste, it's just wasted. Demolition on the, on the left, deconstruction on the right. And it's obvious which one is the future, the future pathway. Thank you. Such a compelling pitch um, and beyond a pitch. Uh, yeah, very, um, very compelling. So much, so many statistics. And uh, that's really, that's really helpful. Um, more clapping from other panelists. Um, uh, Dr. Hazel and Rick Denhart, it's, uh, you guys are up next. I'll let you um, get yourselves okay. organized. Let me share my screen with the right presentation. That's always helpful. And please let me know if you can see it all right. Yep, looking good. Okay, if I can get it to run now, that's what I want. Well, thank you so much for letting the Southerners into the party. It's been wonderful hearing what everyone has had to say. And I'm uh, relieved now that I, I didn't put in a definition. I felt guilty and I'm so glad that it was beautifully covered. Um, Tonight, I'm gonna to talk on Raising the Roof, Deconstruction for Community Health and Legacy, and that's the title of our book that's coming out in December. And this is a story. There's been mostly in the world of deconstruction scholarship, uh, it's about economics and environmental business aspect of it. So what we wanna say in the next 12 minutes is a story, a completely different take on it. This comes from chapter eight of our book, which is on deconstructing disaster. And that was built, that chapter was written uh, on two scholarly studies that I did. One was uh, on economic and environmental impact, and the other was on the psychosocial, the human impact of it. So this is an emotional presentation, and I need to put the audience in the space of the people who experienced what they did and then had uh, got to participate in deconstruction. So Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans on August 29th of 2005. This is a city that is a valley of land between mountains of water. So it's below sea level and protected by levees which failed on that day. And this is what it looked like on the ground. The winds are still blowing here when the levees failed and the water started filling uh, the Lower Ninth Ward neighborhood. When they stopped blowing, the water began to flow even heavier, so the wind was no longer the big danger. This is a family clinging to the pillars uh, of their house, trying to keep above the water. 
And it wasn't just the water alone that was such a terrible uh, experience for them, but this water, as you can see, is an, has an oil slick in it. Southern Louisiana has a lot of chemical industries. So the water was filled with sewage and chemical uh, spill. People climbed through the rafters of their houses onto the roofs in 100 degree heat. They only had the water that they could carry onto the roof. And this went on for days, three days at, at a minimum before food or water began coming into the city because the United States government didn't respond. This woman was at the convention center with her baby. They were dehydrating, the baby was severely dehydrating. So she went through the streets begging for water. There were recorded 1,577 deaths during the storm, but there, that's a lot of contentious. Uh, there's a lot of contention over that figure because um, the way people were recorded as dying differed with insurance companies. If you died because of the storm, your life insurance company would pay out a claim. But if you died of thirst or if you died of a heart attack triggered by thirst, it was considered a natural cause. So it might not have been considered part of the storm. What the pictures don't uh, convey to us is the horrific smell that people endured um, in the city because of the bodies which no one could collect. Fortunately, uh, after the it was really more like four days. The United States military came in. They were not able to even drop a pallet of water from a helicopter. But finally, they, they came into the city. And at last, New Orleanians were uh, given a place to go uh, and find refuge. But the problem is, this is a city that loves together. It plays together, dances together, argues together. It's a city that loves its people. And one of the worst things that happened to it was they were separated. So now let's get into the deconstruction part of this. This is a picture of the Lower Ninth Ward. This is where Rick and I live. It was the hardest hit neighborhood in the city. Water was as deep as 30 feet in some parts of the Lower Ninth Ward. And this is what it looked like close up. As you can see, these houses can't be rebuilt in the place where they are. Many of them floated down in the streets. They crashed into one another, but there was surely a lot of good material in there. Now I need to sidestep for just one little minute because there's another story that adds to what's happening here in, in Katrina. In 1857, there was a free man of color named Pierre Fazen, and he started a town called Fazenville. And this was uh, a wonderful mainstream town with a church and a school and a grocery store and everything a town would need. And he built this for people coming out of slavery so that they could transition into uh, a mainstream life. In 1964, the United States government moved in with eminent domain and they took possession and bulldozed all of the houses in Fazenville in order to build the monument to the, um, to the Battle of New Orleans. And the people who lived in Fazenville were moved to the Lower Ninth Ward. One year later in 1965, Hurricane Betsy hit and it flooded the Lower Ninth Ward and destroyed the homes of, the, of those people. But there were many other people from other parts of the city that had been in the Lower Ninth Ward and it's a historic area. So there, there were families that had been there many generations. Now, one reason I, I mentioned Fazenville is because I was asked to, but also we just recently had a memorial ceremony for it and put up a, a, dedication, a dedicated marker so that the world would know that it existed and it had an important place for the people of New Orleans. Now there was one more catastrophe. One month after Katrina destroyed the Ninth Ward, Hurricane Rita came along and it wiped out any gains that were made in the month since, since uh, Katrina. So what I'm establishing here is this is a population of people who had trauma after trauma after trauma. And so when Rita left the area, 275,000 homes had been destroyed. 
The government ordered an immediate mandatory demolition of any homes that had more than 51% damage. And the residents, the owners of these buildings had no voice. But Mercy Corps came in, they, they sent down Shane Indicott from the Rebuilding Center in Portland to take a look and see what could be done with this material on the ground. And he looked at some of the 30 million tons of debris scattered across New Orleans. And he said, we can save a lot of this. So Rick was brought down to uh, direct the deconstruction project there. And he also became a uh, director of Gulf Coast Recovery for Mercy Corps. Now there was always salvage going on in New Orleans after disasters, particularly architectural salvage. Beautiful pieces of houses had, were being stolen, unfortunately, and sold in cities outside of the region. Although there was a quarantine on the movement of any wood because of um, the insects. Now, if I can get my, there we go. So the first thing that Rick did when he moved into the city uh, was he relabeled the material on the ground as a resource. And whenever he spoke to the city or any other um, vital people to keep this project moving, that's the terminology they used. And then as we just heard, uh, it takes you know, four people to do a deconstruction job where it would take a, somebody with a machine one day. It takes four people two weeks, although we hear now that there's faster ways of doing it. Um, so this was really vital because people needed employment. So this was the first house that they deconstructed the wreckage of. And you can see that it turned into quite a pile. To the untrained eye, it's hopeless, but to the architects, I know you could see a lot of good in it. They took 30% from this structure they were able to salvage. But what really surprised me was the couple that owned the house. When, before the project started, they were very despondent as most of the residents of New Orleans, as the whole city was like everyone had been in a car wreck together. And they, they had that, uh, very sad downturn look about them. But when this project started, they just became buoyant, full of energy and enthusiasm. And they weren't keeping this material. They were giving it away to the community. And I wanted to know, what was it? What was the thing that triggered this change? So I, conduct, I, I conducted a phenomenology, a grounded theory design. I used a Transana software to analyze uh, my data. And I found that the core phenomenon was empowerment, but there were three subdomains of that. Now, just very quickly, when you do a, a grounded theory study, you take tens of thousands of words and you sort them into categories. You usually want between three and 12 categories. And then you try for a phenomenology to bring that down to one. And that one was empowerment. But here is a look at the categories that supported that. The first was a wrenching decision to, to let the building go. They had people that had been generations in the same house. There was one house where the, uh, the wood was green when they built it and the great grandfather's fingerprints were still in, in the wood. And to let that wood go was just agonizing. But they also wanted to get into the project to resist as an act of defiance to resist the mandated demolition. They lived in a constant state of fear that a machine was gonna show up without notice and the building would be gone. And they just couldn't believe that it was worth absolutely nothing. They were told that it was worse than nothing, that it was in fact dangerous. And they also couldn't stand the idea that, that this beautiful material would be wasted. And they were sad to see the building go. It had a personality, it had meaning, it had a character. And so to preserve part of it, was important for them. The, the second was empowerment, which became my ult, ultimate theme, but it had supporting uh, categories of its own. There was huge relief. Human hands were on the building now. These people were no longer alone against the machine, and that was big. They felt that there was respect for the building in the hands of the people that were taking it apart. And they discovered value out of the ruin They also felt dignity from the way it was taken down and that allowed them closure 
and grieving and the beginning of healing. This is what really shifted that probably one of the most important elements was sharing, not keeping the material and reusing it, but sharing it. They felt as if this were, were um, organs that were sharing life itself. And the last thing was they wanted to spread the word that was huge for them. And they felt empowered in going out and spreading the word and telling everyone that they could. Preachers began preaching on deconstruction to their communities to let everybody know that they could do this. Now that's what came out of the psychosocial study. There was, I'm, I'm at my end here, there was the um, environmental and uh, economic piece. And I'll just say very quickly, that that was important to show worker motivation. The people, um, the construction people in New Orleans are often stereotyped as being not quite as energetic or on task or as quick as other groups. But in this project, in this study, they were, uh, they outperformed the other deconstruction teams nationwide in other studies of, of efficiency. And that it also spoke to where the material, the material went. So that's the end of the presentation, but I want one little second just to brag, please, that the contribution uh, Rick and his crew in the response in New Orleans with this deconstruction garnered Mercy Corps a Nobel Peace Prize nomination in 2008, which went to Al Gore, which was exactly where it needed to go. But thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Yes, clapping. Um, more virtual applause coming through the chat. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just, we'll just, I'm going to pass it right over to, yeah, uh, to, to Dr. Andrew Judge. Um, I think we'll all have lots to talk about. Pass it right over. Bonjour, Annie, Mindewe, Morgan, and Doug. I am related to everything. Um, Como se indigo, the name the spirit has called me is Bear Walker. Michigan um, Dam, I am Turtle Clan. Deshkan Zibing in Dunjuba. I was born and raised along the Horn of the Serpent River. Anishinaabe Ojibwe and Indian Dao. I am an Anishinaabe Ojibwe man. Louis Shaganashi, I'll speak English. And I'm also Irish. And I just want to take a moment to thank the previous speakers, uh, very informative um, conversations uh, and, and knowledge that I'm generally unaware of in the circles that I uh, contribute to. So uh, thank you for those uh, words and that wisdom that you shared. It's uh, pretty amazing some of the work that's happening. Uh, I'm also gonna take a very different approach to my presentation. And I hope that uh, it uh, adds something, another layer to this conversation. So um, where, do I, where do I begin? Even before this um, opportunity to speak, you know, I've, I've had a lot of conversations about deconstruction. Um, I generally approach it from uh, an indigenous lens or an Anishinaabe lens, and that is the knowledge of my ancestors. I had a conversation just before um, today with another Anishinaabe man. And we talked about the difference between knowledge and wisdom and how that has become obscured uh, as, of, as of late in, in our current iteration of uh, civilization that we are all participating in. So, where I want to make a contribution to today is, is with respect to um, I, I, the way that I'm thinking of is that we're, we're talking sort of like the death of the building and, and actually um, what's the word like giving, giving um, like respect to the death, uh, and, which is something that um, my ancestors have practiced for generations. Uh, Adam, you talked about uh, trees that were 2,000 years old, and at 2,500 years, that's 100 generations. And our stories and our knowledge goes back much further than 100 generations. 
And I feel privileged to have uh, carried on the responsibility of the knowledge of a hundred generations. It is a, is, a, is a big responsibility. And um, part of that responsibility is um, giving, giving respect to death, but also the life. Uh, and, and so that's where I'm going to focus today a little bit is about the life and how as Anishinaabe people who lived and thrived in um, southwestern Ontario for over 100 generations, um, how did we perceive the world? How did we build our buildings? And I hope that for a moment we can get out of our heads. I want you to try to forget everything you thought you knew about Indigenous people. I know that some people have spent time with elders, have spent time with uh, the wisdom of um, that generational knowledge. But there has been a projection onto the consciousness of the colonized of our civilizations as being primitive, as being um, a childlike and a number of other very sort of uh, diminishing constructs that are, are held within the minds and the hearts of, of the colonized. And I am one of them. I am, I am colonized. <laughs> I don't, uh, uh, while I might be on the, that continuum sort of moving towards um, decolonized, uh, I, you know, I grew up pretty much like everyone else and was kind of told the same things, you know, this idea of the Indian, so to speak, of, you know, roaming around in a forest with sort of like a, a diaper on and not much more carrying a spear and, uh, you know, ready to kill the, the next thing so they could get their, their meal that day. And I want to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. Um, our civilizations planned and we, we planned for at least seven future generations. And what does that look like? Well, it means that when, if I was born, you know, 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago, when that uh, seed of that tree, Adam, was planted, you know, by uh, the ancestors of that land, you know, I would have been born into a civilization in which already every action that I took um, not only left a, a, a trail that picture, um, um, but I was, I'd be walking on the trails left by um, the answers at least seven generations back who knew that one day I would be, I would be there in that place. And so when we think of that, and um, it, it, in the present, this work in deconstruction is really, I think, incredible. Uh, the, the work that everybody's doing in that environment. Uh, I'm thinking about it as I do renovations on my house, like um, recyclable reusable materials, and who may uh, come in and tear down as I did in my own basement here when I arrived a year ago. Uh, and start to rebuild um, something more beautiful. But when I think of uh, deconstruction now, I, I'm actually thinking about um, the lumber that we know will be used um, and continue to be used beyond the deconstruction. Of course, it represents a small uh, sort of a fraction of uh, what's happening in that industry. And for the most part, it is uh, and continues to be demolition. Which, which is awesome that there are leaders like yourselves uh, stepping into that environment and saying, let's, let's preserve, let's give respect to the, the death of these, these spaces that have held um, so much knowledge. And if only that same respect was given to um, those ancestors who planted those trees, um, which, which inspire awe, just like... Uh, uh, I think of the sweet chestnut in southwestern Ontario, where I think many people are currently, uh, and where I spent the majority of my years. You know, those sweet chestnut trees that were 150 feet tall, they don't even have records that say they grew that tall anymore. Um, but how did that tree get there? 
Well, right now we are in a, a climate emergency. In fact, I, yesterday I was really surprised to get that email from University of Waterloo, which I'm currently teaching a, a course called um, Indigenous Knowledge uh, for a Changing Climate. Um, and they, they declared a climate emergency and what leadership it must have taken as an institution to do such a thing. Uh, but we are, we are in that right now. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that we need to start thinking about what the climate will be like in 10 years, what the climate will be like in 20 years. And if um, we look at this from an in Indigenous knowledge perspective and that wisdom perspective, what the climate will be like in 150 years if um, uh, varying action is taken. That's where my mind and my heart is um, consistently. And right now I'm thinking about, well, I'm gonna show you a really short video of the work that I'm um, doing on the land at um, Algoma University. So this is another time-lapse video, but obviously to get to this point, um, it, it, it take, I took a lot of work. And from my perspective, I'm, I'm deconstructing sort of the colonial narrative on, on what's normal on the land. We are creating um, a corn spiral here. And essentially it's going to be a nest for the seeds that I have taken responsibility for in my life um, as a result of the teachings of um, many, many um, indigenous leaders who in turn have taken that responsibility on themselves. So I just wanted to show you that really quick video and as I sat there today and we worked on the land, it's, it's at a further point now, we we're, we're, we're erecting our um, um, trellises for the beans. We had a conversation and I know that uh, one of the students who is helping is in, the, in this room right now. We had a conversation about um, what it means to do this work and, and what it means to plan for future generations and how important it is, the care that it takes. And I was glad, Hazel, um, that you mentioned, you know, the care and, and Adam, it seems you do the same. Um, but I'm taking care of the, the seeds, these seedlings, and uh, we have to make sure that they're going to have a, a, a full and abundant life because their civilizations are as important as ours. They have as much of a, a right to uh, thrive as we do. And we come from uh, um, a system of knowledge where the entire community thrived. And it thrived because we planned. Um, I was going to do a whole thing, drawings and stuff, but I, I just don't think I'm going to do that right now. I'm a little bit tired uh, as a result of having um, a vaccine today. But what I want to say is that our civilizations, we were attuned to the earth in the sense that we were planning as the climate changed. And what that means now is that uh, beyond the industry of the deconstruction, the, there's like this in, in immense amount of planning and conversation that happens to have the, uh, that has to happen this cross uh, I would say cross industry dialogue the forestry industry has to have conversations with the architects the architects have to um, have conversations with the land preservationists the seed savers um, there are so many people who have sort of been siloed um, as a result of um, the colonial narrative who at this time, we cannot wait for the government to tell us that it's okay. We have to have these conversations now because 10 years from now, we may be at uh, 1.5 to two degrees of warming, which means that you know, there may be 200 million climate refugees uh, um, uh, by that point. And, and, and if we get even further to that, and you know, there are some projections that we will get to eight degrees of global warming if we do not immediately reverse our course of action. And uh, that means the desertification of the entire planet. So this is where we're heading right now. <laughs> And I mean, I'm not talking a hundred years and it may happen if we just uh, 
um, change, you know, and stop using plastic straws or something like that. Um, this is happening. We are in it. And, and so I hope that we can start to plan for the trees that we need to plant. The, the land conservations who want to protect the land and leave it be, that's not how it was before. We didn't leave the earth be. We planted it. We designed it strategically, uh, deliberately, so that uh, knowing uh, what would happen or at least predicting what would happen in 150 years, those um, descendants could utilize uh, our planning to thrive. Now, <laughs> the complexity of what I'm saying is, 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 you know, extraordinary. It's, it's not small the way that I'm thinking. It's not, um, um, it, everybody has to do this. Everybody will have to take action. And those that don't, I, I think the ones that can't take action right now are the ones that uh, um, need our help the most because there are so many people right now just trying to survive um, as a result of um, the actions of capitalism. And I'm not saying that capitalism must die. I'm saying that we need to um, have a reiteration. We have to have a, a reconceptualization of what it means to have a, a, a civilization. <laughs> Otherwise we won't. <laughs> it's literally that simple. All these industries, all these things will not exist in 50 years. None of them, if we do not take immediate action. Um, and so what action can you take? Well, for me, take off the grass. <laughs> take off the grass off your lawn because it's the most uh, invasive species on the planet and plant prairie grasses, plant tree, tree species that can help that land to breathe plant edible habitat um, and, and look to not only the indigenous, the native species that are provided. This is exactly what I'm doing on my own front lawn. My neighbors, I don't know how happy they are. They're good neighbors, but you know, I'm tearing up my lawn and I'm planting all these medicines and um, uh, medicines that are going to create a root base that are going to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and and um, you know prairie grasses have a 20 foot root system Kentucky bluegrass has a, a two inch root system that's carbon right that's carbon that's being drawn out of the atmosphere and it's uh, carbon um, positive I can't remember if it's negative or positive you know it's it's causing more um, carbon to to maintain these kinds of um, habitats than it, they're taking from the environment. So those are small actions that we can take on a much larger scale. We have to start to, um, in our forests, indigenous people didn't just live in the forest, we designed them. We designed them with trees that produce um, nuts, that trees that are going to create lumber for our homes, and trees that are simply going to grow to be 2,000 years old so that they could exhale what we inhale. Right? We understood this on a level that is, is truly remarkable. And uh, um, I hope that I added just a small contribution to today. Sorry if I took too much time. Um, I, I do hope that um, that work that you're doing continues the deconstruction work, but I, I also want to say let's think about the the beginning of the life. And right now, I think we're all awakening to a new consciousness, um, and we're stepping inside a circle together as um, as brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles, grandmothers and grandfathers. Um, and let's look at each other, not with disdain, but with uh, love in our hearts to say, um, um, uh, thank you for existing. I remember, I remember my responsibility as a human being and my responsibility is to ensure that all, all the beings of this, this one earth that we have, our mother, um, in my language, um, all the beings have a, a right to thrive um, and and our ours is the greatest responsibility because we were the we were the last to be placed. We are the lowest of the, all the consciousnesses. We, we rely on all of the others for our survival. 
but I, I, I believe that we can do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't, um, you know, accept these opportunities and I wouldn't speak on this topic. I know that we can do it. Um, so I um, thank you for your time, Miigwech. Miigwech is abundance. It's not thank you. It's, it's I have so much I can't possibly take anymore. Um, thank you, Miigwech, to those who uh, shared before me. And um, um, yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Allison. Miigwech, Miigwech, Andrew, and um, to, yeah, to all of those that came before him. Um, there's just, I mean, you so beautifully sort of tied together um, so many of the things that we were discussing, uh, ideas about compassion and care and stewardship and thinking in this intergenerational way that is really what is the call to action in terms of pivoting and the sort of really, really fundamental shifts that are being proposed here. Um, so it's, um, it's really uh, beautiful to think about sort of deconstructing colonization by planting a garden, um, by thinking forward um, um, to sort of how materials will be used and um, also thinking back by literally touching buildings um, as they are passing through their, their sort of like different, they're transforming as materials move. Um, everybody said such kind and interesting and um, compelling things. And I, um, we have just uh, 15 more minutes left in this event. Um, I think I'm going to just pass it to um, the panelists to um, ask questions to each other. Um, I'm sure that you have them. If you don't, I have tons and I'm sure that Juliet would have some. We can also open it to the audience, but first I wanna give you um, an opportunity to respond to one another. Um, so yeah, I'll just sort of popcorn style if anybody has, an, has a question for other panelists, um, please. Uh, I was wondering about the there's questions on the side. I, but yeah, I have, I have a, I've got a question. I was, and it's really a question for everybody. Um, it, it, Susan really sparked it in my mind. Uh, what, what does it take to get more um, funding for research uh, in this area, especially of the things that Andrew was saying and uh, the looking into the legacy, I mean, and, and the um, impact on the people receiving the materials. There's, there just doesn't seem to be much research. And I think that's a good place to start. I'm just wondering if what you all think might be a, a good way to stimulate that. Well, I think one of the ways we often, if I can jump in, uh, one of the ways that we often have to find our resources in, in a sort of heritage context that this ACO series is part of um, is by making connections with other things that are better funded. Um, and one of the hot topics these days is the circular economy and it's starting to get funding. Um, so just in that sort of prosaic sense of what are some of the expanding discussions that are becoming, you know, priorities for research grants. Um, there's a bunch of new things happening in Canada anyways around circular economy that, to, to, that they're looking for people to propose research. So um that's one response to that but i also have a comment that i wanted to make earlier but so i'll let other people answer hazel first i um i i'll just share in the chat box um here it is so the canada has a 2030 agenda or national strategy uh for sustainability and uh, i have uh, receive funding through that. Actually, I, I left that behind in my previous work. It was a big grant for like $360,000. Um, but I, I moved recently and it was built by the community that I worked with and I, I couldn't possibly take that uh, from them. So that work is ongoing in, in Kitchener and, and Cambridge area. But um, in that national strategy, I, I encourage people just to review. Some of the things are really good. Uh, of course, we could always go further, but um, I think that there's, if we can approach this work based on that national strategy, there's certainly uh, a, a large pool of funding uh, backing that. Yeah. 
Susan, do you want to, um, I well, don't know. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah so I, well, it's a different, it's a different thing, but I guess I was trying to think about different ways that we've talked about the values and ideas here. And it struck me when, um, when uh, Hazel was talking about how Rick had had to relabel things, resources to, to make people rethink, you know, what things were. And then in contrast with that, um, Andrew is making me think about the sacredness of materials, the sacredness of the trees, and, and it's almost the opposite to the resource type discussion, you know, but it's, it just really interests me that deconstruction and thinking about buildings and building materials in this lifelike way gets us to having that range of, of necessary labels. Um, mm -hmm. And it enriches things when we don't stay too narrow that like that we have to be able to kind of flow between these and, and see the values that they're all happening you know um if it's yeah. a business you've got to be able to talk about the money value um if it's uh you know your sacred ancestors legacy you have to be able to talk about that um and if it's you know the embodiment of your loss and dignity like i mean there's just so many it just seems to me that well, it's like many things that we see in heritage where we need to be able to um, to talk about a lot of things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and yet when we're communicating with other people, find the trigger that has them say, yes, okay, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will give you money. Or um, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found, that, I found that in... in throughout my research and time uh, sort of on this topic is that deconstruction. And I think that's sort of represented in this panel today that deconstruction is um, as a term sort of coming back to this notion of a definition. It is something that is amorphous and applies to a lot of different contexts um, and is, is easily um, made a case for um, and depending on the sort of like the value proposition, the, the, the thing that is motivating people. Um, and at the same time, there remain so many challenges um, to it. There's sort of what we're seeing now is sort of propositions about scaling up and needing to do that sort of rapidly, sort of Andrew's like email from a university and um, Adam's call to sort of uh, or, or um, vision for ex um, expanding nationally. Um, and as Susan mentioned, there's uh, a real need for um, interim spaces, uh, these spaces to store the, a knowledge of networks. And so I have, a, I guess, if I'm curious, maybe um, Adam can speak to a question about sort of how uh, to scale up um, how to scale up reuse at the same scale that deconstruction can, you know, you can scale up deconstruction, but to how to, how to scale up reuse on a cultural level and maybe other folks have a different um, approach. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're one in the same and they, they go together. Um, so I know uh, at least out here on a policy side where we, we do a lot of work with um, policymakers, Vancouver, Victoria, uh, and elsewhere. Um, and we're really pushing them that if they're going to mandate deconstruction on the one side, then you need to mandate material reuse on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, it's not the policy, but it'll be the industry and the culture that drives it. Uh, much like you see in like Portland, the the appetite for used building materials in Portland is insane. Like nothing leaves that city because the culture, that's, that's what they believe. Um, Vancouver is is just awful for everything has to be brand new. There's no respect for the past or not no respect. It's just, just the, the culture here is just throw away, build new and bigger and better. And um, so there needs to be a cultural shift. And I do think that that's where a policy can actually help nudge that, that along. Um, I'm actually even amazed at a lot of green builders and architects that we talk to. And number one, they don't see any value in the materials when we walk in. 
and there's uh, they say oh this old dirty wood I'm like do you do you understand where this comes from like this is from a 2000 year old tree this is not just lumber and it's not dirty that's that's a aged patina that's worth more money than new lumber um and we yeah we just have this lens um that we're looking at things the wrong way and and i think there's a question here about the usability materials and in general i find people um, like some of the victoria builders right now are, are grumpy about this new bylaw that passed that they're going to start mandating deconstruction they say well you're adding to the affordability crisis like why are you forcing people to pay more to deconstruct your building and my thing is the problem is not the deconstruction costs more. The problem is, is that we've become accustomed to cheap demolition and we've become accustomed to paying $8,000 to remove a perfectly livable house and just bulldoze it and throw it in the garbage. The, that's the problem, not the cost of deconstruction or the cost of these materials. They deserve that cost. Mm -hmm. We need to get over this hump of just thinking everything is disposable and abundant, clean it away, cut it and, and build it new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Hazel and, and Rick sort of suggested that the cost is actually um, much larger, uh, the cost of demolition is much larger uh, in, in a sort of cultural way, in that the sort of the, the impact, the layers of trauma, um, and um, that that occur when that happens are, um, they're not monetary, but they're certainly manifested and intergenerational. Um, yeah. Can I add one thing to that? Yes, please. Yeah. So <clears throat> I just felt um, just to just to add a, a, a small piece. I think there's um, beyond the policy, uh, you know, a challenge with community. You know, we've really um, separated communities, um, and and through class, through uh, wealth gaps. Um, you know, through culture, racism, you know, getting into those kinds of things. But I feel like if a community really came together and valued the homes that people are living in, not based on the material wealth that's within them, but that that's a home in their community that houses a family or a person or someone who, who, who lives and is, you know, it's so hard to like, cause, cause we don't think that way anymore. We don't think like that person, my neighbor is part of my community. Like I should love them. I should care for them. And it might sound crazy or whatever, uh, just, but it only sounds crazy because of the way that, we have our, our, the way that it currently is, right? Uh, so I think that each of us have a responsibility, you know, if there is um, a, a building to be demolished, that if the community really cared, you know, the politicians will listen. Uh, and if, if it's beyond the profit that's going to be made and considering the, the that, you know, our grandchildren might not have even have an opportunity to, to live, to drink water, you know, like that's kind of, I don't know, to me, it's, it's crazy not to think that way, right? So anyways, uh, that's, that's a big thing, though. I know that it's not an immediate change. Mm -hmm. It's one neighbor at a time and conversations and relationship. I think that's really valuable, um, maybe as as a some almost ending note um, to relate to policy, um, which from what I understand, uh, there are so many emerging policies. We have San Antonio, we have Vancouver, we have Victoria, um, we have Portland. We have so we have precedents um, that, and those are just in North America. Um, but one of the lessons that I've learned is that policy is not a, a cut and paste. It's, you can't just stamp it across cities. It really is a cultural, um, a cultural uh, project and that needs to be tailored, that recognizes values and how they change. Um, and that's a place-based study. And in that way, deconstruction is also sort of this like mode of this way of conserving because it recognizes those nuanced values that are relevant, um, especially when proposing such sort of system change um, that we are here. Um, so that's a, a, a maybe a, a great um, sort of call for 
um, everyone who's interested to um, reflect and engage with the conversation in their local place and sort of also to speak and develop allies, um, um, allies and, and partners and, and collaborators across industries and across uh, di um, yeah, discourses. Um, because as Andrew said, it really requires a sort of a diverse community of, of voices. Um, so speaking of voices and their diversity, um, we have so many so many questions in the chat and we have one more minute <laughs> left of this event. Um, so uh, Juliet has uh, copied them all. Um, and we're going to try to find a way to uh, respond to them, um, maybe uh, in uh, over social media or uh, in a uh, on a larger uh, sort of distribution way. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for attending and sticking with uh, this event, um, and especially to the panelists for sharing all of your. Uh, your incredible experiences and thoughts. Um, there's so much more for to uh, discuss here. It's such a big topic and such an important one. Um, so I hope this is just the beginning of uh, a, 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 great, a greater conversation. Um, there is one more event in this series. Um, it will happen next week. Um, and uh, on this same day, Thursday, um, uh, May 7th, it's uh, on displacement and sort of thinking about um, demolition and, and deconstruction um, and uh, the, in a broader way, thinking about the displacement of materials. Um, and as Susan alluded to sort of where are the other sites, what, what landscapes are generated um, through these processes, what places are built, um, what communities, um, change and, and react. Um, so um, feel free to to register for that. I hope to see you or hope for you to see me and the, the other panelists there. Um, thank you again, Miigwech, Miigwech, Miigwech to um, all of the speakers um, and good night to everyone.